Yes, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us and for being interested in this topic of uh, qualifying assessments. And with that, I'm going to open up the presentation and just make sure that screen sharing is working. Okay, y'all should be able to see a presentation right now. Is that right? Yes, I'm I can some... see. It. All right, thank you so much. Okay. So um, as, as I mentioned, or as Anitra mentioned, I'm a product manager at the U.S. Digital Service, and I've been focused for the past year or so on this issue of SME qualifying assessments. We've been doing this in partnership, and I cannot speak enough about how grateful we are to be working alongside uh, U.S. OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, as well as a wide variety of other federal agencies. So we've been working together to move this forward. And I'm gonna start first by talking about the problem that we that we start to solve when this project started about two years ago. The project, the, the problem that we've heard and that has been mentioned uh, kind of an intro text for this. If you're a hiring manager, or if you're an HR professional working with hiring managers, hiring managers may say, we're getting certificates. That's the list of people that we can select for a position. So the list of people available to be hired without people on those certificates that are truly qualified. And what that means is that the hiring manager doesn't necessarily want to make use of that certificate. And so that we have the data that says that half the time, hiring managers in the federal space do not make selections off of competitive certificates. It might be that they're making selections off of a uh, internal merit promotion type of situation. But in all those circumstances, people are applying to jobs and they're not able to get through. And one of the reasons is that certificates do not have people that are truly qualified. Um, that's, that's a very big problem for the government. And it means that access to those positions is oftentimes more limited, especially to people that are already hired or already inside the government. So why does that happen? In many instances, and this is not a universal description that I'm making, um, applicants are assessed for federal positions in delegated examining, that's, that's delegated examining for the competitive service, uh, through kind of a three-stage process. First, people submit what is known colloquially, this is not an official term, but is known as a federal resume. And this might be something that is 10 plus pages in contrary to the normal uh, practice in, in most employment of like a two-page resume. And it's a very exhaustive, extensive list. You're, you're listing a lot of different positions. You have lots of bullet points for every position. After that, applicants are asked to self-assess. They're asked to rate themselves where you are in terms of skill. Are you someone that is unfamiliar with a given area, or are you someone that's an expert in a given area? And something that we learned in our research is that applicants have learned uh, over time and through experience and counsel each other to self-assess very favorably, let's just say, where people are saying, I'm definitely an expert in that, I'm definitely an expert in this, I'm definitely an expert in that. And that can lead time to an equity issue because we know that some people are more likely or some demographic groups are more likely to self-assess more positively than other demographic groups. But we're relying on these self-assessments to tell us who is most best qualified and who may not be as qualified. And we take the results of that federal resume that has someone from HR that looks at it, the self-assessment, and then we move forward into uh, adjudicating veterans preference. We move forward into formal ranking and rating, and then we deliver that cert to those hiring managers. And we know that sometimes because of the ways that ranking and preference work, the hiring manager may have someone at the top of that list that they have to hire who's not actually qualified for the position, who would not be able to be successful if they were hired for that position. But this process that we have of screening, this federal resume and the self-assessment questionnaire do not provide evidence of that. And it can be very hard, especially for technical positions, for someone in HR looking at a resume to say, is this resume demonstrating the skill? It might be claiming a skill, but is it demonstrating the right skill? Does it, does it you know, reflect mastery of these, of these topics? That can be a very hard thing to assess. So because of this process, we end up with certificates that are skewed where they, they might have people on them who are not actually qualified for those positions. We know that that can happen for reasons that are involve equity. And then the result is that people are not hired and the government does not get, the federal government does not receive the people that it needs to hire um, in service. So the uh, change that our team wanted to experiment or the intervention that our team wanted to experiment with was making applicants show or demonstrate that they are qualified. So not just saying, can you tell us what your level of qualification is, but can we assess that formally to understand where people are in terms of qualifications. And I can see that the poll will close in just a few minutes, so if you, in just a few seconds. So if you haven't responded to that, please do. Um, so this is something that is not uh, normal, or it may not be a thing, it might be a thing that surprises folks. 
Um, Anita, I'm getting a request to annotate the shared content. I don't know if I should hit approve or decline on that. So sorry. What was that again, oh. Will? I didn't hear you. It's a request to annotate the shared content. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Should I call I'm, I'm going to hit approve. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. So, and I do not actually want to be annotating, so let me stop annotating myself. Okay, so you are, you are allowed to make applicants prove that they're qualified, and that takes this form, where, and I'm so sorry for the, always with the PowerPoint with the cramming things together, we go from resume review to a passing score assessment, and that's an assessment where it's possible for an applicant to fail if they don't you know, demonstrate the skills and the proficiencies and the competencies that are needed for the position. And then from there, we go to ranking and preference and from there to the certificate. So instead of asking applicants to assess themselves, or maybe there's a component of that, but it's limited, we're going to do an assessment of those applicants. Of course, this also raises definite concerns of, are we doing this correctly? How do we make sure we're doing this correctly? How do we make sure we're doing this without adverse impact? And I'll talk about these things in turn. But this is the fundamental change. I'll just jump back two slides. Going from a federal resume self-assessment to ranking and preference to a world of resume review, a passing score assessment, and then ranking and preference. And we do this by utilizing subject matter experts. So because this is something that, that may be a new, a new practice for you, especially in the federal space, I want to just show two pieces of background that kind of say this is, this is not a change in policy. This is not a change in what is allowable process. This is simply um, executing on something that was already possible. So in the Delegated Examining Handbook, this is uh, for people not in the federal space. This is a really important reference a document for HR professionals that are doing hiring for delegated examining. It says uh, there's a way that you can have multiple assessments with a cumulative passing score, and if the applicant fails the assessment battery, the applicant is not eligible and is notified of that ineligibility. We know that's important because a lot of times when people apply to these positions, 90, 85, 80 percent of people are passed ahead as being qualified, and we want to make sure that, that we're only passing forward the folks that are demonstrating those qualifications. The second is a memo from September 2019, and um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to read out the whole thing, but just to say that it is encouraged to use subject matter experts with diverse backgrounds and relevant experiences to work with HR to determine if applicants are qualified, for example, with structured interviews. So this is a practice that is already part of existing uh, policy, and our pilots have, have, we've already piloted this process in collaboration and in coordination with OPM. So now that we know that this is a thing that, that's possible, I, I know that a lot of agencies might not be used to it or might be uncertain about, well, how do we actually go about executing on this? So I'm going to illustrate to you one possible way of doing so. But first, just a few final numbers to post. Um, in 90% of competitive announcements, we're doing that. We're only assessing with that self-assessment questionnaire. That's the public data right now, according to a public dashboard using OPM release data. We know that in 47% of those job postings, no one is getting an offer. And let's just think about what does that mean in terms of availability and impact? If you're someone that doesn't already know someone in a federal position and you apply to a federal posting, you might find yourself continually being told, oh, no one was ever selected. Your name was never passed to the hiring manager. And it can feel like you're, you're tossing your resume into a place that you don't, a process you don't really understand. It can be frustrating. And we know that in 47% of these actions, none of the resumes that are, that are put in are ever hired. And that can lead to people that don't kind of have a sense of what's going on inside to feel to feel uncertain or to feel confused. Whereas when we use our piloting process thus far, we've always had at least one offer and in all but one circumstances, at least four offers made in each in each of our pilots. So here is the process and I'm going to take my time going through this slide. So take your time reading it. I'm, I'm going through this one piece by piece by piece by piece. We'll illustrate some of the aspects in later slides, but we tried to demonstrate the whole thing so that it's easy to kind of see from start to finish how this process might work. So first, um, in the world of uh, job, federal jobs, you always want to start with job analysis. Job analysis for many of you is probably a familiar topic. Um, for others of you, it might, it might be a new term. That's a time that we are gonna talk about what is involved in the job, what are the skills needed for the job, and how are we going to go about our, doing a posting so that we can get people who are qualified for the position. So to do that, we gather subject matter experts, HR professionals, and hiring managers all in one room together, ideally from multiple offices if you're doing pooled hiring, but it could be could be, just be from one office. 
and we'll talk about what are the elements of this job? What are the things that, that you need to know in this job? What are the competencies and skill sets that you need to have on day one of this job? And we determine what, are, what is then, how is the rest of this process going to work? What's going to happen in these green boxes that are in the middle here in that job analysis workshop? We talk about what is necessary. And when you gather that group of SMEs, you want to have a group of subject matter experts that are diverse in their backgrounds and that can speak to all aspects of the job. You don't want to be too focused in that. In that job analysis workshop, we create a job announcement. And we want that job announcement to be something that is as approachable to people who are not familiar with federal hiring as possible. So we want to use plain language. We don't want to have a lot of federal jargon. We want to explain the names of offices if we name them. These are small things, but they end up adding up so that applicants feel like they, they understand a position that they're applying for. And we put that up to USA Jobs. And then you, you'll do some significant work to make sure you're recruiting from all the right audiences. It's not and it's not enough in our experience to put something on USA Jobs, although that's required. You also want to find what are the groups, where, where do your subject matter experts get information about uh, job postings, and how do we go to those same groups to make sure that people can find out, oh, there's a job that's, a, that's available, one where I might be a, a good fit to apply. So we have that job analysis workshop. We've created a job announcement. And then there's various ways of going through the process of assessments. This is not one single way that, that it has to go. but in this illustration, we'll start with resume review. So that is applicants have put in their resume, and we're going to have multiple subject matter experts review that resume and say, is this resume demonstrating the competencies we're looking for at the appropriate proficiency? We're going to use the materials from the job analysis workshop that we know are tied to success and performance in the job, and we're going to pull those and rely on those in resume review. So for example, if a position requires um, a lot of knowledge of analysis or analytical ability, and we'll talk about that later, uh, you might say, am I seeing this on a resume? And crucially, the subject matter experts are experts in this topic. So there's not one exact way that a resume might express this. There could be a variety of positions, a variety of jobs, a variety of backgrounds that can all demonstrate the competency that we're looking for. And that's one of the really key reasons why it's important to have subject matter experts but also to train those subject matter experts so that everyone is on the same page and well calibrated so that everyone is having the same experience in resume review. Ideally, you also have someone that can redact all the names of those resumes or even the names of, of things like colleges because we don't want anything that can be a source of bias in an ideal way. But SMEs are looking at those resumes to say, are they demonstrating the core competencies and proficiencies as we need? In this example, let's just say hypothetically that we had 98 applicants we might have 58 that don't move forward. So now we're taking 40 applicants into the first round of our assessments. Now in these assessments, there's a variety of options of things that you can do here, depending on what's appropriate for the job. In our pilots, we've seen structured interviews as, as a very common uh, tactic. We've seen asynchronous interviews that I'll talk a little bit more about later. We've seen um, job uh, work sample essays, where we might, ask, we might give someone a sample task and say, go ahead and do this, and then we show the result of that to a SME. You don't have to do two rounds of assessment. You could do one round of assessment. It all depends on what your subject matter experts say. One thing that we have seen, though, is that if, if it's appropriate to have, for example, the structured interview in an assessment, it might make sense for you to do a stage in between resume review and a structured interview. If, for example, you want to test written communication, because that's not something that you can do in a verbal structured interview, um, you might do that in between. That also means that you won't be committing the time to those interviews that can be very time intensive uh, until later on in the process. You want to do the most time intensive stuff at the end, and uh, that way you're using your limited time of subject matter experts very effectively. So we've gone from resume review, we've gone through a first round of an assessment where maybe 40 applicants were there. Let's say that 16 didn't move forward. We're now in the second stage with 24. We might have our SMEs do, um, our subject matter experts do st oral structured interviews with those folks. And a structured interview, for anyone that isn't, isn't familiar, is a uh, regulated uh, interview process where everyone is asked the same questions. We want to make sure that everyone gets the same questions, that the same follow-ups are available, and that we're consistent in that way. And then finally, we get to the federal process of issuing a certificate where you might have, according to the rules of delegated examining, best qualified, well qualified, qualified. And at that point, we are also bringing in veterans preference and we're making sure that anyone need, that needs to get selected first is being selected. But the most important thing about this is that by the time we've gotten to these 14, the hiring manager can have confidence that all of these people have demonstrated the skill sets needed for the job. 
And so some of the equity concerns that we hear sometimes in hiring managers that might say, you know, they really don't, may, may not trust a certificate that they receive, they can trust this because they were in the room in job analysis. They were part of creating what does it mean, what does it mean to, to set the bar, to set an accurate bar about what's needed as a minimum level of proficiency. And then they have helped make sure that the SMEs that are in the room are good uh, subject matter experts that can make those evaluations well. So that is the process one, two, three, four, five. And I know there'll be time at the end for questions. I fully expect we'll go back to the slide, especially for folks that are maybe a little bit less familiar with the federal HR process. But for those of you that are HR professionals, this should depict a different version of going through the hiring process that you know. So giving folks just the time to, to see that anymore and what it means to determine that applicants meet the minimum requirements, I'm now gonna move to the next slide. And we'll talk about some of the specific pieces here just to help you put it in your imagination. This is a job analysis workshop. Um, what, what uh, For folks that uh, need to hear it uh, verbally described, this is a image of people standing around a table with lots of post-it notes on glass behind set the kind of table. This is from a real job analysis workshop we did to hire customer experience professionals, CX or customer experience professionals in a government-wide posting. So we brought together CX professionals and subject matter experts from a wide variety of agencies. And we talked about what are the elements that are needed for this job. And we started with job tasks. From those job tasks, we did groupings. You can kind of see the groupings up there. And then from those groupings, we determined what are the competencies that are needed to perform at the GS-13 level, at the GS-14 level, at the GS-15 level. We were specifying each of those different levels um, within a given competency area. That was a long conversation that took place between HR professionals, subject matter experts, and hiring managers to make sure that we had something that was consistent and that we could apply fairly across the entire board. The advantage of combining all these resources, though, is that it meant we could take in many more applicants. <clears throat> And then we could share the burden of this assessment across all the different agencies. So what that looks like if you're not in person, this is an image with a bunch of uh, yellow boxes that reflect sticky notes from a, um, a virtual job analysis workshop that we did. We got everyone looking on a virtual canvas together. They grouped, they, they created job tasks, they grouped them together. And from that, we worked through these to eventually determine what the competencies and proficiencies and assessments would be in job analysis. So this is a job analysis workshop in person. This is a job analysis workshop online. And then the, the kind of things that we're producing are competencies and proficiencies in our pilot. So a competency, one example here is analytical ability. Um, that is a very uh, precise definition of what is the skill set, what is the thing that we want to measure um, to see that someone needs to be successful in the job. And then we're defining different levels of proficiency for that, for that given competency. So someone might have a basic level of understanding, they may have some understanding, extensive understanding, or they may be a full-on expert in that area. There's a wide range of performance. And we want to define what does it mean to have sufficient performance uh, for to be able to be qualified for this position. We're not defining what we want. I, the ideal candidate, that's a, different, that's a different bar, what it means to be best qualified. We're just defining what does it mean to have the minimum qualifications to be able to move forward in the process to be considered on the certificate. <clears throat> and these are the kinds of definitions that you might use in that, in that circumstance. Um, <clears throat> where, because this is a public webinar, I'm using an example that's more generic. Of course, for any specific posting, we wanna make sure that we've done that work in job analysis to justify these. So this is the kind of thing that you might produce. And when you go through this and then apply this and, and look at who's qualified, here's the way it works out in some action. So, I'm, uh, this is another version of that graphic, you know, one, two, three, four, five, except now we're talking about two specific actions, one at the Environmental Protection Agency, one at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. In these two pilots, you can see that a fairly large number of people applied. They went through resume review. A certain number went to a written assessment. A certain number went to an interview. And then of those, um, eight qualified for EPA and 12 qualified for CMS. Uh, EPA was seeking to hire four people. They made four offers, got four selections. It was great. CMS was seeking to hire uh, 10 people, and they think they made 10 offers. They were not ultimately as successful in selections. I think they hired seven or so people. But this is many more people than oftentimes get hired in federal actions, where you might have an experience of no one getting hired a majority of the time. Sorry for that automatic slide advance there. So this is going from one, two, three, four, five steps to the process. You can see we started with EPA with four subject matter experts, at CMS with eight subject matter experts. 
you just want a big enough group that you can process the applicants that come in. Because this is delegated examining and because we want to ensure fairness, we're treating every applicant that comes in the same way. It doesn't matter if you're the first to apply or the last to apply, everyone is going through these same steps. And of course, there are other provisions where you might have a late applicant who can also be considered in that way. If you have a late applicant that comes in that um, has the right to be considered, you can put them through the whole process and they'll just kind of catch up with everyone else on the way through. So that's the process by which people can get qualified and then eventually get offers. We know that this is a topic where people get very concerned about veterans' preference and making sure that we're being we're treating veterans correctly. And so the feedback that we got, uh, this is from one of our first pilots, this is the best way to find and hire a qualified veteran. We can't wait to bring them on because the veterans that come through this process or everyone that comes through the process, you verify they have the qualifications necessary, they've gotten that passing score, and so the hiring manager is happy to hire any of them. And that's why we've seen at DOI, even though they were intending, I think, on hiring 10 people, they ended up selecting 13 because they were so happy with the folks that had qualified. Remember how I said earlier that oftentimes in federal hiring, 80, 85%, 90%, sometimes, not, not with every agency, but sometimes our people are found qualified. In this instance, we have 22% in our HHS pilot, 11% in the DOI pilot. And of the people that come through, we want those people to be selected. It's important to, you know, if you have done the work to come through and, and, and put your name in the hat and you're qualified, ideally folks can be selected. And so there's mechanisms like the Competitive Service Act or other tools by which you can share out certificates and names so that people can have the best chance of being selected if they've gone through this qualification process. You can maximize the benefit of this process for our users. So in a government-wide action, I talked a little bit earlier about that one example for CX. Um, in CX, we had 15 positions for nine, with nine agencies and uh, one job announcement. We made uh, 22, I think it worked in now 28 selections. Um, it was just a little bit disrupted by, by uh, the epidemic last year. And then in the data science hiring pilot, we had 62 positions that were open for 10 agencies, and those selections are currently in process. I look forward to being able to release more information about where we are with those. So for those, we're bringing together lots of agencies um, because many of the needs that we have in government are common. Um, they may not be, you know, one generic need that applies across an entire job series, but there's one, there may be a, kind of a similar need that many agencies have. So if you bring agencies together and you talk about what are our shared needs here, and you can have a diverse and equitable group of subject matter experts and hiring managers in the room, and you create a good set of assessments, you make sure those assessments don't have things like adverse impact, then you can bring forward a lot of people into the government at once, and instead of every agency having to run its own selection process, everyone is able to work independently. So for example, the EEOC has been hiring and looking at the data science cert that we just released, along with many, many other uh, federal agencies. I think this is the set that was involved in the CX action. The other nice thing about government-wide actions is that OPM is the um, HR specialist for these. So when OPM is the HR specialist, they, the cert can stay open for a year, and agencies can request it even after that certificate's been generated. So you don't have to be part of the initial posting to make use of these certificates. So you can request it later. So that time to hire metric that I know is so important for many of us in federal HR, that time to hire can basically be zero. If you determine you have a need, you request the certificate, you find someone who's already on the certificate, already qualified, you can make them an offer. You don't need to actually go and post that job. That reduces the time and it gets more people selected. And when we qualify more people, when we get more of them selected, we know that means we're gonna end up with a more diverse group of people that are able to take federal positions. So that is the benefit of government-wide hiring where agencies are sharing this burden. You can also do this within specific agencies. For example, within commerce, you could have NOAA, Census, and NIST all collaborate using commerce's authority. So in the government-wide results, you can see that we had 290 people that came through out of resume review in the CX action, 369 in, um, for the data action, and then we qualified 44 with now I think 28 offers. But you can see that the, the numbers are able to be a little bit higher because we have more subject matter experts available because the agencies are working together. The ideal impact of this pooled hiring process is that, and you can do this at your own agency right now, is that everyone that qualifies will have a greater opportunity for selection. If we're only ever hiring one person per action, that one person is oftentimes because of preference going to have a more specific background. 
So the more you're doing pooled openings and pooled hiring, the more likely you are to have a diverse and equitable set of people that you can bring into your agency. That is why we highly suggest pooled hiring as a process that you can take. There's some other pieces about, about doing this work that can be really helpful. One is that the work of getting all these interviews scheduled can be quite, can be quite time consuming. So uh, we have piloted and worked with some third party tools to make hiring easier and faster. We can maximize the time of HR, we can maximize the time of subject matter experts. One example of that is a scheduling tool to allow applicants to self-schedule instead of having to work out manually when people are available for interviews applicants can schedule that themselves. Instead of having a live interview where you have to have people talking to each other live, one thing we've experimented with is an asynchronous interview where applicants call into a system, see a video of someone presenting a question to them, and then they record their response um, with a little timer in, in the top right. And they can re-record it. So this process offers some level of convenience, right? Because applicants can then do the interview at any time of day. They don't have to be available during business hours, for example. Uh, and subject matter experts can review that on their own time as well. They can review a bunch of interviews kind of in one go if they need to. They can use some of those podcast tools like listening at 1.25 speed that might be helpful. But we also know that it can be a negative uh, or not as fun experience for, for someone to do in a synchronous interview. So it's important to think about how you wanna make sure you have human contact and are maintaining a good applicant experience if you do something like this, but we found it to be an effective tool. We also made a website that is a self-service website intended for HR specialists seeking to do this process. Um, that is smeqa.usds.gov, referenced other, other places in the presentation. And we made an, a resume review prototype that is now um, kind of under work for being built out for long-term availability through existing tools. And that will automate the process by which subject matter experts can be reviewing resumes. So instead of having to manually distribute resumes to people, you just have them all log into this tool and the tool takes care of making sure that people are responding to and evaluating the right things, the right competencies. So these are some tools that we created to make it easier to develop this process because we know it takes time to involve subject matter experts. The process by which people assess themselves while it has some equity concerns it is faster when an applicant can, can do that when they apply than having them do some type of assessment and having subject matter experts review that assessment. And that website, one more time, is smeqa.usds.gov. And I'll um, make sure it's mentioned at the end as well. When you think about the time that it can take to do this process, um, this is something that you can do from the time of the job announcement to a certificate. We've done it uh, twice now in five and a half weeks. We did our, government, our first government-wide action in six weeks. It just takes making sure that your SNEs are available and really making sure that your HR specialist is available or that you have a backup. If someone gets sick, if someone's child has to get pulled out of school, things like that, you wanna make sure that you have backup plans so that you don't lose applicants. We've gotten feedback from applicants that it's important to them. They, they want to work in federal service. They know that job is important. They want to be involved. But if they get a private sector job offer, they have to decide to wait um, on that federal offer. And the longer we make them wait, the more likely it is that we might lose them. And so the more you can have that process take place with resume review, going straight into assessment one, straight into assessment two, I think it's possible even to be a little bit faster than these pilots were. Um, the more you do that, the more likely it is that you're gonna have people that can accept their offers. We, de we lost one of, our, one of our best qualified candidates at CMS because we just were not quick enough to be able to get that offer out. So that is, that is where we are in terms of time to hire. Now, remember, I'm not counting the time in job analysis, uh, the job analysis workshop here. So we've done it in one instance, we did the job analysis workshop week one, we posted the job week two. Uh, I know that took a fair amount of, um, of work to make sure that that job announcement was ready to go. So in other instances, we've done job analysis a few months in advance of the job being posted. It all depends on what the timing of when you want those certificates delivered to be. It's also really important if you want to make selections in under six weeks that you have um, an HR specialist who's able to make sure that they prioritize this action and someone that can be a project manager who can make sure that the SMEs are being coordinated, that trainings are being scheduled, things like that, that, that PowerPoints are being reviewed, just because there's a lot of moving pieces and every one of these pieces requires its own training. 
Every single time we want to make sure we're going over with those SMEs. What are the prohibited personnel practices that we need to make sure we avoid and that we're training them so that they're all calibrated and working together? That's something that happens every time because HR is involved in this process from the start to the finish, not just in the training of people, but also in verifying and checking that the subject matter experts are doing proper work. We noticed in one of our first pilots that a subject matter expert said, oh, you know, I have a concern about this applicant. They're overqualified. Well, being overqualified is not a reason that we can make someone ineligible for a position. So HR is there every step of the way to make sure that we are doing and applying the process correctly and to make sure the SME's assessments are correct. That's happening all the way through. So in all of our pilot state, you can see all the selections that we made. Uh, sometimes agencies have only wanted to hire four people. That was EPA and the four security specialists. Other times they've wanted to hire fewer. GSA was seeking two UX designers, ended up selecting four. Um, <clears throat> DOI was selecting 10 IT specialists, ended up selecting 13. CMS was seeking nine data scientists, ended up selecting 14. So we've had su success in all these pilots getting many people selected <coughs> with other government-wide and other agency pilots going on right now. Um, with tools that, that you can also do this. And we have some other actions kind of coming along the, uh, coming down the line as well. We're also working on mechanisms by which those certificates can be shared so that more agencies can be collaborating together. Not just that you might work with OPM for a shared posting, but also you can work within the Department of uh, State or within the Department of Commerce and do a shared posting that way. That way, it's not one agency, not one office, it's taking on the work of assessing these applicants. It's more offices working together, which means you can take more applicants. That also solves for an equity problem. And with that, that is the first, uh, that is the formal presentation time. I know I took about a half hour to go through all that. I am sure that there are follow-up questions that exist, um, but that is the, uh, I didn't want to take too much time of just kind of monologue. So I'm going to leave it on this right now and see the results of the poll and look forward to the questions. Okay. Well, with that being said, this will uh, conclude today's uh, webinar and stay tuned for additional webinar. Our series will continue throughout the year. You'll hear from me. And I, with that being said, on behalf of the EEOC and the Training and Outreach Division, I say thank you very much for attending and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome.